Allison, in trying to understand the components of free will, can studying children, young children at different ages, help us to dissect the different elements of it? Well, what we found is that we found that different kinds of free will seem to be developing at different ages. So a very basic conception, like the fact that you're free to do things if you're not physically constrained, seems to be in place as young as four and probably younger, probably even mm. in infancy. Mm. A more sophisticated idea, the idea that, for instance, you could act against your own desires, only seems to develop about six. That's what we've mm. discovered. Mm. And in other work, uh, Tamar Kushner and Nadia Chernak have discovered that the idea that you could act against moral constraints doesn't seem to develop until quite a bit later, till eight or nine. So even seven and eight-year-olds think that it, you literally can't do otherwise. Uh, you can't do something that's immoral. You don't have a choice about doing something that's immoral versus uh, moral, which is very different from what the adult philosophical conception might be. What, what's an example of, of a test you would give to a children? So here's, a, here's an example. So you see uh, the child has a choice. Again, the child can choose to draw a square or draw a circle. But you tell the child, look, here's Doggy. And Doggy gets very sad whenever he sees circles. He really doesn't like circles. It makes him really miserable if you do circles. Now you have a choice. You could draw a circle or you could draw a square. Well, all the good little children draw squares instead of circles. And then you ask them, uh, Nadia and Tamar ask them, could you have done otherwise? Could you have drawn the circle? And uh, four-year-olds and even six-year-olds say, no, I couldn't have drawn the circle. It would have been, I couldn't possibly have done this thing that would have made uh, Doggy hurt. Whereas seven and eight-year-olds say, well, of course I could have drawn the circle. I just shouldn't have. It wouldn't have, been, it wouldn't have been the right thing to do. Yeah, yeah. So they seem to have the idea that you could freely uh, violate or follow the moral constraint. But yeah. the younger children seem to treat the moral constraint as if it was like, you know, it, hurting the dog was like yeah. stepping off the yeah. stool yeah. and yeah. floating in midair. It was yeah. something that was really impossible right. to do. Right, right, right. Um, but the real question we want to ask is not just, well, are four-year-olds different from six-year-olds? We're different from adults. But why? What is it that's leading to these underlying changes? And that's the work that we're working on now. That's what we're trying to understand now. So one idea, a kind of philosophical idea that I have about where these ideas come from is that even as infants, children seem to have the idea of agents, people that are going out into the world, making things happen, happening, changing things in the world. And they seem to have a very clear distinction between the agency, the things that people do that are, that are what philosophers call exogenous, that are just determined from inside of them, and then the objects in the world that we act on that are passive and that can't make things happen, that people can make things happen in a way that objects can't. Um, if you think about thinking about your own mind, though, one of the interesting things that happens is now think about, so, so when you're thinking about the way that we affect things in the world, there's a very simple story. There's agents, they do things, and that makes things happen in the world. But now think about a case where you're influencing your own mind. So, you know, you're looking at a delicious cookie and you're forcing yourself not to eat the cookie. What you seem to be doing then is you're acting, but you're not acting on the world, you're acting on yourself. And whereas in the case of the physical case, you can say, all right, here's the agent, the agent's over here, and here's the patient, the object you're acting on, it's over here. When I'm trying to keep myself from eating the cookie, it's all going on inside of here, right? I'm the, the person who really wants the cookie is in there, and the person who's stopping the person who really wants the cookie is in there too. So my hypothesis is that it's that kind of conflict that leads to uh, this notion of free will as if there was a kind of separate agent, say a soul or, or some metaphysical agent inside of you, different from just your regular <laughs> desire and belief psychology. Um, it's a way of trying to solve that puzzle about how you could actually influence your own uh, mental states. And, and what is the experimental design that you're using? So the experimental design is we can show that children are, <laughs> one of the things that we, we know about children between four and six is that they're actually not very good at, say, acting on their own minds to uh, defer gratification. So if you actually give a, a, a four-year-old famously a task where, for instance, they have to, they have a choice where they can either wait for a few minutes, sorry, you put a marshmallow on the desk, and either they can eat the marshmallow right away, or if they wait a few minutes, they'll get two marshmallows. And uh, it turns out that four-year-olds, as you might imagine, have a really hard time not immediately eating the one marshmallow and getting to the two marshmallows. 
By the time children are about six, they're much better at doing that. And this turns out to be quite profound and important. Differences in how good children are at doing this predict how well they're going to do in college many years later. Mm. Um, so one question you might ask, uh, uh, another interesting thing about these experiments is that the way that children solve the problem at six is not just by kind of beefing up their will. What they do is do things like turn away, sit on their hands, whistle, <laughs> do things to themselves, to their own minds to keep them from succumbing to the temptation of the one marshmallow. Mm. So what we think is that there might be a connection between this ability to defer gratification, this ability to do things to your own mind, and this higher level, more sophisticated conception of free will. So what we're trying to test now is to see, when we look at fours and sixes, are, say, the four-year-olds who are saying, yes, you could choose to not eat the cookie, the same ones who actually themselves can avoid eating the cookie. And we'd like to know what the causal relationship is. Is it that having experiences like trying to keep yourself from eating a cookie when you're four leads you to this broader conception of free will? Or is it that actually starting to develop the idea of free will, starting to develop this idea that you're autonomous, that you could do things even, you could do things to change your own desires, is that what's enabling us to be able to do things mm. like, enabling the children to be able to do things mm. like deferred gratification? Mm. So that might be a case where this sort of philosophical concept that children develop, I'm autonomous, I can do what I want, really is making a difference to the way that they act and what they can do and how they function in the world. How many of these differentiations of free will as you've seen developmentally are humanly innate that would be cross-cultural, and are there any cultural differences that result as children get older because of the nature of the culture? So one possibility is that children are undergoing these changes because they're having new experiences or that these changes are leading them to have new experiences. But another possibility is that, after all, we, cultures tell us a lot about things like what we can do and what we can't do and what we're free to do and what we have to do otherwise. And of course, the children that we're testing so far, are, you know, children in a Berkeley preschool, <laughs> they're immersed in this incredibly individualistic yeah. culture which emphasizes autonomy and individuality and all the things that you can do. So the other thing that we're doing is we're testing children in China, um, a much less individualistic culture, to try to see if they show the same kind of developing intuitions about free will that um, that the children in uh, in North America do. You better do it quickly. China's changing. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's part of the part of the the question. Um, when and in other uh, experiments, our collaborators are doing work in rural Nepal, mm. doing the same kind of work, and we're just in the midst of getting the data. But there are already some interesting and somewhat unexpected differences between the way that like children in China are responding and the way that American children are responding. Um, so the children in China so far it looks as if they're particularly likely to say that you can't um, inhibit your actions. So even more, sort of counterintuitively, even more than the American children, they say that if you really want the cookie, you just have to go for the cookie. You can't not uh, go for the cookie. Now, it's tricky because it might have to do with the language, it might have to do with other kinds of factors, but so far that somewhat counterintuitive result seems to be the result that's coming out. So I'll we can report later on what actually happens when we look at all that cross-cultural uh, data in detail. But again, this speaks to some of these philosophical questions about how much is this just part of our innate way of being in the world? How much of it is a way that we justify or try to make sense out of a wide range of experiences that we have? How much is it a kind of illusion that we develop to try to deal with experiences? And how much is it the result of culturally determined factors like what our religious beliefs are, or what our views about moral responsibility or, or blame are, other things that are outside of just um, our trying to make sense out of the world around us. And again, development gives us a window where we can actually see are there cultural factors and when are those cultural factors kicking in, and how are they related to the child's own experiences, the child's own inferences, the child's own ways of thinking about things.